Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get dad for Father's Day? You should check out Row One Brand's Vintage Pictorum Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for dad this Father's Day. Instead of a boring old tie, get him a historic baseball photo taken by Henry High Sandum at the historic Polo Ground Stadium in New York City during the 1894 Temple Cup. Or, if he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 vintage NFL poster. These are so good looking that you'll be amazed how they turn out. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one and save 15% off your order. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. On September 7th, 1997, the video game Final Fantasy VII was released in the United States of America. This game is widely considered by many fans as the best in the series. A very successful series and franchise, might I add. That's why this game and the franchise had a cult-like following. Some might call it a fandom, I suppose. On this same day, the Oilers lost their second game of the season. Not really that significant. However, the important thing to remember to tie into this week's guest is a week earlier, they played the first game ever in the state of Tennessee. Welcome to the Football History Dude Podcast, where each episode is a journey back in time to learn about the rich history of the NFL. Your host is Arnie Chapman. Football is his passion, and he wants you to come along with him to explore the yesteryear of the gridiron. So hop on board his DeLorean, and let's get this baby up to 88 miles per hour. This time, as we step off the DeLorean, the date is May 23rd, 2018. We're anywhere USA, or maybe the world, maybe the universe. Who knows? Maybe they got some dudes listening to this podcast over in Plutarch on Flea Blob or something like that. They're listening to episode six of the Football History Dude podcast. The first ever listener's favorite football moments episode. Now, if you haven't heard of these or you don't know what I'm talking about, it's something that I did a little bit earlier in the podcast where I would, for lack of better terms, let the listeners of the show send in their favorite football moments of all time. And then we played them on the air. Well, on the podcast waves, that is. And this week's guest, Jeremy McFarlane, I'll tell you what. This dude was the first non-friend or family member to send in his favorite football moment of all time. Speaking of that, another reason why this week's guest is this week's guest is because Jeremy is incredibly important and special, mind you. Very special to not just me the Football History Dude, but the Football History Dude podcast and the Sports History Network as an entirety. Now, I'm going to transform you back. I'm going to go with the one. Boy, I'm better yet. How about we take the DeLorean back to, I don't even know the actual date, but I know it was early May 2018. Or maybe it was late April. Hey, let's not get hung up on the dates because it was when I was recording, I like to say episode three, but it might have been episode four, but I'm sitting there recording an episode. And I'm getting a little bit, at that time, it was kind of challenging because I'm trying to work through this whole thing, don't know what I'm doing. And then it comes along a a message. It was like a, I don't know, it was a direct message via Twitter or something like that. It was just a message from some random dude named Jeremy McFarland, who now was not random. (laughs) That's why he's a guest on the show. But he reached out and he said, hey, man, I'm listening to your show. I really like it. You know, the Football History Dude podcast. (laughs) Talk about the first moment when, I don't know, you own a business, that first dollar you put up on the wall, or whatever whatever you do in life. I could go on and on and on, but we got to get on this show. And that's what it felt like with Jeremy. You see, he reached out of his way to tell somebody that he enjoyed his podcast. I'm just some lowly dude in the in the closet in my bedroom recording this episode, and I get this person from, at the time, who knows, he could have been half across the world, half across the universe, I know, like Flip Flop and, and Glarb over there, like I said, but he reached out and he told me, I like what you're doing, and that gave me fuel for my tank. And who knows, 
it could have been it could have led to the fact where I'm still here today. I might have stopped. I might have pod faded, what they call it. And after a couple episodes, just nah, no, no traction. I'm not getting anything. I'm bouncing. I'm out of here. But in fact, it stuck around. I mean, it's pretty cool. Again, like this dude reaches out to me, and then he's the first to purchase an FHD T-shirt of somebody I didn't know in person. <laughs> he even wore that T-shirt when we had the interview. So, not to be one of those guys that wants to brag or get my head out the door. I can't fit it out or nothing, but gotta say, it's a, uh, a feel good. Oh, use the word. It's a feel good experience when somebody else that's not a family friend and reaches out purchases a t-shirt from you, wants to show off your brand, and wants to talk to you about it. So again, I'm very honored, thankful for Jeremy for being there in the beginning for me. And that's why I want to honor him by bringing him on this show to share some football memories and talk about his podcast, Football is Family. Now we're going to get into this Football is Family podcast, the origin and all that stuff, but instead of me talking about it ahead of time and getting in the interview, I think now's a good time. Let's play that trailer, the very first episode for Football is Family. I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Jeremy McFarlane, and I am here to talk about something that I enjoy, and I know you do too. Enjoy the NFL. The NFL may not be life, but it makes life better. How many of us have spent hours collecting football cards, reading the latest magazines, watching games, playing video games? Tech Mobile Football is one of my favorite of all time, by the way watching sports shows and talking with fans with the game that we love. How many of us have had posters on the walls of our favorite player or team? And how many of us have moments that we hold dear and value that that took place either in front of the television or a stadium? I'm talking diehard tailgating to the most festive Super Bowl parties. We all have moments like that in our lives. How many of us have joined fantasy football leagues to earn the ugliest trophy you've ever seen? I've won four, by the way, recently, and yes, the trophies are pretty ugly. To all of us that love football, this podcast is for you. In the course of this podcast, I want to delve into the history of each and every one of the 32 NFL teams, along with the great players and plays which made those teams special. I also want to talk to fans of each one of these teams and see why that particular team is important to them, what makes their memories that they hold dear so special, and to get their perspective on why their team is great. I'm a firm believer that football is family, as we find out what makes each of these NFL teams unique. We will discover why that's the case. I hope you'll join me as we go down the list of the 32 NFL teams. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. There you go. Football's family. We're going to get into the interview, but first, maybe mash this pause button. Head over to sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash podcast. Scroll down. Find Football is family right there. Click on that button and go ahead and check out his page. Save it, bookmark it, do whatever you got to do. Come back here, listen to it, maybe do both at the same time, and then go listen to his back catalog. And speaking of his back catalog and the podcast, when you're over there and you just paused it, because that's what you did, right? You just paused this right now. You went over to sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash podcast. You notice all those podcasts right down there? You scroll down, you got the American football history, you got basketball, you get all these different things. That's because we're trying to create the headquarters for sports yesteryear via the podcast medium. Sure, we're going to have websites and all these other things, but what we're doing right now is focusing on a podcast. So go ahead, find your next new favorite podcast of sports history. And then if you have an inkling yourself to join and start your own podcast, just reach out to us on the contact page. But for now... Let's get into that interview that I keep teasing and promising to you with Jeremy McFarlane. Make sure we actually have all this stuff on thing because speaking of uh, promoting, so this kind of will dive into maybe the episode and we'll get after it as we go, but uh, promoting. So at the very beginning, I wanted to tell you that you are one of the reasons that the football history dude still exists and the sports history network exists. I mean, even before you even started your show, because you reached out to me. I want to say it was episode 
three I was recording in my closet, something like that. I just remember us having a, a little Twitter conversation and I was totally new to the whole social media thing too. But like you gave the little fuel for my tank, you know what I mean, to continue to go on because somebody that I didn't know reached out to me and said, hey, I like what you're doing. And it, it, I just wanted to give you that thanks and gratitude as well that maybe you might not even know about. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, you, Arnie, and uh, and I'm going to put another plug in for another show I listened to, Hysteria 51 with Brent and John, were two of the first podcasts that I listened to. I listened to, to Hysteria 51 because I love the supernatural stuff, but I'm into football history and I'm into uh, a lot of things like that. And I said, well, wonder if there's a podcast like that out there and it come it came across your show and I thought this is awesome and I just threw it out there saying maybe he'll respond and you sure did so uh I think how long ago was that Arnie you're at episode what 189 190 <laughs> I don't even know what this one will end up being yeah that we're recording but I was oh geez uh I started April 20th, 2018 was the very first episode so we're coming up on four years now pretty wow yeah. You just made me realize four years. I, I it just it seems like time flew by. <laughs> yeah, and I, and I, I, I can tell you that I went up to my wife with my phone and said, the football history dude responded. He responded. <laughs> and she's like, OK, <laughs> nerd. I'm like, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And even to go take it a step further. So episode six was the first time I had that. I don't know what you want to call it. You know, the listener episode where we everybody chimed in with their favorite moments from football. Oh, yeah, and yeah. <laughs> you were the first one that I didn't actually know, you know, a friend or family member that sent in their favorite football moment talking about the Music City Miracle. And there was some other, you know, backstory stuff in there, too. So uh, just again, thank you. And oh, no uh, I, I'm pretty sure you're the one that said catch you on the flippity flop in there, too, if I remember. There, <laughs> there could have been back. that in there. I'm a little bit of a goober. I could have probably said that. <laughs> so speaking of that, that's really why I brought you on the show. You know, I wanted to talk about, OK, let's go with the podcast Football is Family. Uh, maybe let's get into the mission of Football is Family and why you started it and kind of like the origin story, like how it all came to be. Well, I'm a when I, I, I kind of go back to 1997. Um, I'm applying for colleges and I started seeing that the average person doesn't get scholarships, doesn't get a lot of look at. I mean, I was vying for scholarships with people with 4.0 GPA and I had a pretty decent GPA, but I was, it was just like, I'm just the average person. Didn't get a lot of scholarship offers. And the more I see in life is like the average person doesn't get a lot of focus or fanfare. We're kind of just there. And when you and I started talking, I wanted to do one about the history of each football team. I thought that's just that you've got that you're doing that. And the other guys on this, on this are doing that. And I could do a little bit, but I said, you know what, what if we let the average person and I say average, that's not, that's not downgrading. I'm an average fan. I know, I know I'm just one of, of millions, but I have a story. And the people who write these books are the people who, who go to the games or buy the tickets, they have a story about why they like it. And a lot of their stories are based upon family, you know, their dad or their granddad. Uh, there's a guy that goes to church where I preach at. He said that his first memory of football is when he was sitting in his uh, uh, den or living room with his dad, listening to the university of Tennessee on the radio and his dad had a little football field on the ground, kind of, I don't know what it's like, a little board. And he was going up and down it with a with a marker saying, this is where the play is. This is where the play is. That's what I want with this. So when you and I were talking, I think when when uh, COVID was really, really hitting, uh, I thought that's what I wanted to do. And it kind of blossomed from there. Uh, I've had a couple episodes where I had my dad on one time. I had my uncle on one time. I had my my wife and my three kids on one time. So, yeah, there's football, but there's also the family aspect. And I, and I think that when you take just the average fan and you say, why do you like it? You get to see that their story is not average. It is a, it is extraordinary. Yeah, I mean, I can relate too. just from coming. I mean, like you said, you listen to my show a couple of times and we talk about my gramps all the time about how like just 
football that's in our in our dna you you call up and gramps was gonna say hey you're ready for some football and we'd always hang it up with go lions and you know since since uh the show has been on you know he's he's been a big big part of my i guess you could say uh not belief system what is it um the thought the thoughts of why i started the show when i when i say at the very end of it um you know i'm through if you're through or i guess i end it with hey dude i'm through if you're through that actually came from my gramps it's a saying that he said and it was always at the end of a conversation sometimes it was you could tell he wanted to (laughs) he's like i'm just done with this conversation i gotta go eat or something he's like well I'm through if you're through and you like hang up without even giving you a chance to say <laughs> bye sometimes. So, but Hey, the guy made it to 90 years old, so he could do what he wants. Yeah, yeah. At that I point. still, and, and I'm not going to go into any detail, but I love that picture of him in front of uh cowboy stadium. That <laughs> you see? Oh yeah. Yeah. Yep. That definitely was one where, you know, it was a joke in the family where my dad said, when I moved down to Dallas, it's like, Hey, you know, Gramps disowned you, right? Because you know, then being an anti Dallas fan and, and everything. I mean, it wasn't that he really, and you know, the weirdest thing is and seeing anti, as I sit here with my, I got to show you this really cool coaster I got for Christmas. It's like uh, it's a Barry Sanders. It's uh, like ceramic. I don't know what, I think this is ceramic. It's from Detroit news. And my mom got it for me, but like for the the strangest thing is for being such a Lions fan, my grandpa really wasn't that big of a Barry Sanders fan for whatever reason. It made no sense. He didn't like Barry. He didn't like Michael Jordan. He just didn't like the great ones or some for some reason. But it was uh, you're getting me off track here because you're talking football as family. Perfect segue into your your your, your podcast because again, I could go on and on and well, on about how football is family. And Arnie, that's that's the whole point. Uh, one thing I like and. I've learned with my profession, I talk. And when you let people see you're real and you let people see you're fallible and you you like things and you don't like things, they start to talk and they start to make things real. And and when you came on, you were talking about your, your fan. But I've talked to people. Uh, I talked to a gentleman from Houston, from that area, who still misses the Oilers. And I've talked to people from Baltimore who said that it's not the Indianapolis Colts, it's the Baltimore Colts. And, you know, I'm, I'm sitting here with, with my particular team. I benefited from a move. Uh, but talking to people who lost a team, you know, it, it's, it's like you, you think, well, this is you don't even meet these people. They're, no, they're not in your social class. They're not in your economic class. But it's not the people, it's the team. And when that's gone – uh, it's almost like you you lost a part of your life. Yeah, I mean, if I couldn't imagine at this time, because people have mentioned, you know, with the Lions, or would they ever move? And it's it's just my blood. I moved when I moved to Dallas. It was oh, hey, I got to get the NFL ticket because I got to be able to watch every game. And it wasn't even a second thought as to if they move or if I move, I'm going to still be a lions fan, regardless of where I'm located. First thing I did when I went down, well, I shouldn't say first thing, that's not fair, but one of the, the first weekend I was down there, I took a picture of me at the, the high school where Stafford played with my Stafford jersey on, which I still have by the way. And it was two to three sizes too small during the super bowl, but still I'm, I'm rooting for Stafford right. there. And, and, and I'm, glad he, <laughs> I'm glad he won. Uh, if it couldn't have been my Titans, I'm glad that Stafford, uh, he, you could tell from the uh, Super Bowl parade he enjoyed it a little too much. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I won't get into any of that business. I'll just talk about my my boys from the positive light. Well, that, that's what that's what this is about. I Darren on his podcast says he he looks at football from a positive perspective, and I've kind of taken that and said, you know what, let's let's talk about it from the positive perspective. The one thing I like Arnie is I I've had Baltimore Raven fans on. And with Titan and Ravens, we don't get along. And I let them know we don't get along. But you know what? We have fun with it. It's not personal. It's not personal. It's not life or death. It's fun. Yeah. I mean, half the seems like half of the people that are football podcast on the network are either Bears fans or Packers fans for me, too. So, again, I, I like to just just have fun with it. And I can even recall, this is not even relatable, but I can, I remember the exact moment when you and I had a conversation when we were talking, I was in the car when you said, yes, I want to start. You were kind of gave me the rundown of your show. I was in the Taco Bell parking lot. Cause I had to park because I was going to go through the drive-through, but I had to wait. That was because like you said, 
it was in the middle of COVID and right. they didn't have the, you know, you couldn't go inside anyways, but I sat there talking to you for a little bit. And then I went to the Chinese shop afterwards. And the t- I just remember going, man, this is so cool that his perspective is to, I want to talk about not just the history of the game, but to what is it like for the regular fan that just sits there with their family or their, you know, their friends and watching a game and their, their love for it, which kind of gets me into. So let's go a little bit let's first talk about you and you, 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 you dove a little bit into your history. Okay. I came from, you know, the, the, the Oilers came over, but your actual history for your fandom of the NFL and then the Titans separately. It, it started in 86. Um, I was a basketball fan and a baseball fan, but the Super Bowl came about with John Elway Broncos versus uh, Doug Williams and the Redskins. And I just so happened to pick the Broncos and I got destroyed. It was bad, 42-10. I remember that very vividly. And I said, you know what? We don't have a team close by. And I say close by. At that time, Atlanta Falcons was not much of a team. And I said, well, the Broncos look pretty good. So I started following them. And at that point, um, you know, I, I if there was a Broncos hat, I have – and I, I wish I brought it to show you, Arnie. It, it, is, it is ugly. It is extremely ugly. <laughs> but I love it. It's the very first Broncos hat I got. I love the D. I, the, the Cyber Horse, I could do without. The, the D with the Broncos on it. And it, it, it's, it has a D in the middle. And it has Ds all around. It's ugly as sin. I'm just, I'm just saying it. But I love it. And it's the very first NFL hat I bought. It, I wore that sucker out. It's, it's just – but, you know, I followed them through their Super Bowl loss against the, the, uh, the 49ers. Um and then when I got a chance to see them play in uh, the Super Bowl against the Packers, it was one moment where I knew where I was. I know where I was at that moment. I was at Freed Harbor University watching it at third floor at, at uh, you know Benson Hall, and I remember yelling out of my dorm room that we finally won. And people were looking at me like, what are you doing? But, you know, <laughs> I, I finally got to see – my team won a Super Bowl. Of course, they won it the year after that. But what happens is we started getting this notion that we might get a team here uh, in Tennessee. Nashville is about 30, 45 minutes away from where I where I grew up. I said, you know what? This might be pretty neat. I was never really a big Houston Oilers fan. I remember how bad they would beat the Broncos, how great Warren Moon was, and how good they were in Tech Mobile. But I wasn't really – a big Houston Oilers fan. But like I said on your show, the moment that the Music City Miracle took place, I was sold. I still have a Broncos fandom, but at that point in 2000, it has been, and I've actually called it a sickness. (laughs) It's a sickness, but it's one that I, that I've been through a lot of lows in the past 20 years the last four years have been just amazing. Uh, but it really started with number seven, John Elway, and now it's all the way to number 22, Derrick Henry. Yeah, you, you kind of alluded to that a little bit of, you know, you you had this team, then you were sold. It's a different perspective for you in your current fandom for the Titans versus someone like me who I was born in the the franchise, albeit not successful for a long time, was already established for quite some time. And I'm just curious what it would be like to be in a city where you didn't have a team and then the team chose you to come to your city. And then now it's like, okay, I'm hesitant. But because was Nashville really a big football area other than like um, maybe the Tennessee volunteers or here's the thing N- Nashville if, if people don't know the, the the layout of Nashville uh in Tennessee I believe I, Tennessee is an extremely long state and from where I live and I'm on I'm right close to the Tennessee River to Knoxville is about five hours it's a long trip and it's about two hours to Memphis. So it's a huge, it's a long state. Not wide, but long. Uh, and from the time I remember growing up, it's all been a college state. It's orange. I was a Vanderbilt Commodore fan for a while, which I, I'm ashamed to admit. But it's been an <laughs> orange state. 
the one thing that I remember hearing is that Mike Keith, when he came to start kind of advertising, he's the voice of the of the Titans. He would look at the parents and say, we're not going to win them. But those children sit next to them. We're going to win them. And I, while I wasn't a kid, per se, I was oh, how old was I? I was 20 years old at the time, around that time. I still had the opportunity to say, you know what, I have a chance to turn over to a new team because I now have a team that's right down the road. And I, and as a result of that, um, you know, I, I've been to the training camps. I've been to preseason games. I got to meet and greet the, the Titans. I had pictures taken with uh, Taylor Juan and, and uh, Frank Wachek and, and Mike Keith and T-Rack and, and, you know, they became real to me because they were right there. Uh, one of my regrets, and I hate living with regrets, but it's one of my regrets. I stood about three feet away from Steve McNair and didn't say hi to him. Mm. And I didn't want to bother him because he was shopping at a JC Penny, but I saw him. He was sitting right over there and I thought that's Steve McNair. You know, I got to meet Eddie George. Uh, I got his autograph on a Jersey that I'm pointing to that you can't see, but it's right over there. That was a highlight. Um, that guy's humongous and one of the nicest guys you'll ever meet. It's just, I, I didn't have that opportunity to relate to the Broncos, but with the Titans, you know, it's, it's, it's a little different. Yeah. I mean, I, again, I, I grew up and they just were always there. So my, and my, my dad was a fan before that, My it started with my grandpa, as far as the fandom for the lions on my mom's side, there really wasn't, too much as far as sports fandom going on there, but it would just, like you said, be kind of cool to be a part of the groundbreaking and you were the target market, maybe even younger than you for who they were going after, which kind of brings, okay. So you hear this on the show before, but here's that official DeLorean you get to ride in and you, it looks like you're about to break, grab one too. All right. So, so we'll, we'll, let, we'll take your DeLorean this time. Mine's we'll put mine in the shop because the now, kids now, been playing hey, with it listen, a little bit too much. This, folks. this has been a goal of my life. To be on this, I want I want you to ride the DeLorean. I'm going to ride in yours. Okay, I'm well, <laughs> and so so am I, am I driving? You riding shotgun? What, I'm what's, riding what's shotgun because I don't want to dent the fender. <laughs> okay, no worries. We got a good body shop guy. We'll we'll go ahead and take care of this. All right, well, let's we do get it. back. Because you and I are actually taken out for three rides. Normally, we only have one or two different rides on here, but because of the uh, the perspective of your show, football is family, and you get these m- these different moments throughout being your fandom. You're going to be able to take the DeLorean to three different moments that you lived and were able to watch it maybe from TV, but you get to go back and you get to live the moment with the players and the coaches, three different moments throughout NFL history that you've been a part of. I'll I'll take you on Okay, if you want to go back to NFL history, you you can knock me out. You can go to a different moment if you want, even if you weren't around for it. Well, the first one would be the Music City Miracle. Arnie, I was listening to a a song uh, by a group called FFH, and it just kind of randomly came up on Spotify. Have you ever just wanted, it it was so beautiful that I wish I could hear it again for the first time. Have have you ever wanted to do that? You know, I've read several books that I just like, take it out of my head and let me read it again. Uh, I want to relive that moment. I know where I was. I was at Robbins Park in Dixon, Tennessee, but I would love to have been at the game. And freaking out to see that Um, because that place erupted. I have in my office, I have Music City Miracle stuff everywhere just because it was such a it's a key moment, not only in my fandom, but, you know, in in my life, too. And when my son was two years old, he could do Mike Keese. He could go, you know, he, he there's no flags on the field. It's a miracle. He could do that. Uh, That would be one of them. (laughs) <laughs> um, probably, and I, I would say that the other two, I would love to have gone and seen the, uh, the drive, John Elway's, the drive against the, the, the Browns. My dad took me to Canton, Ohio, 90, 98, and I got to see the Jersey and it was, I still had the picture. It was one of those things that my dad was put through a lot cause he's not a football fan. He went up there, sat through four, five, six hours of football history. And that's one of the things that I remember. I would have loved to have seen the drive. 
just because 98 yards, you're not supposed to go 98 yards like that. And he did it. That would have been one of the things that I would love to have seen. The third thing, though, Arnie, I would, as and this is this is kind of a negative. I would have loved to have seen the one yard short Kevin Dyson reception, and I would have loved to have gone out there, you know, paused paused the world for a little bit and called and tied <laughs> Mike Jones's shoes together so he could got the one yard to get him to the Super Bowl to tie it. Hey, if you have a time machine or a DeLorean, you're not going to try to at least make the positive outcome. What are you doing, right? I don't know. I've seen way too many sci-fi movies to know that the, the butterfly effect, it, it's not good. <laughs> yeah, it, it normally turns out uh, wrong. And I'm we're, we're re-watching this TV show called Timeless right now for probably the third time. And, uh, Fantastic and part of, I, Oh, so you know what I'm talking about then. Oh, yeah, they're I trying to go that, back. To, I hate that it ended. Well, that and they tried to end it very well. This is going off the subject of football. And there were some things where I was OK with. But then at the very end of it, they did something. I'm like, ah, you know, it's like bring it back for a couple more seasons. Because, yeah, I, I love that show. So one thing I'm going to do when uh, the Sports History Network gets blowing up big time is I'm going to hire all of the shows I wish would have ended right. And I'm going to hire them to to finish the show. You know, that kind of thing. Oh, just just make a two hour movie. Come on, there that, you go. that show was fantastic. Yeah, I think I'm I'm back on episode seven or eight. So I'm I'm at the point where they just got stuck back in time where they had to like do the whole DeLorean Millennium Falcon thing where they had to like, you know, they had to bring them back through uh kind of like the same thing as like the Death Star uh, dr- tractor beamed in the Millennium Falcon stuck okay. back in the French war area. What is that uh way off the subject? Is that on Netflix or uh, I think we're watching it on Hulu. I'm not sure if it's on other places though. Okay. I I need to look for it then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So again, it's, it's a, it's, it's t- ties us in though, because we go back as, uh, w- you know, Upton Bell recently, you know, called, uh, reached out to me and like brought me on to be, I guess, for lack of better terms, on his show to be a host. So we're going to start a new podcast and he called me a football historian. And I'm, I sat back and I go, I'm not a, football historian but at the same time i guess i brought so many people on that i've been riding shotgun in my delorean with them to go back in time and learn through these other football historians which you've been able to do as well on your show so let's go ahead and give maybe three to five whatever it is interesting gridiron knowledge nuggets for the listener of the show that you learned from the interviews uh well probably the the one that i a couple couple of episodes ago, uh, Bob, my mind went blank on his last name. How to pronounce his last name? He wrote the book on the New York Jets. Bob Letter, Letterer. Yep. Yeah. He uh, he was showing. He was talking to me about how much of a team game the, the Super Bowl three was, and you don't really hear about this team game. But Joe Namath did not win that game. The New York Jets won the game. Joe Namath got the attention. So in his book that I'm reading through right now, it really focuses on the team more than it does Joe Namath. And I think that's something we don't always hear about. Um, so that's one of the things I heard. What uh, Some of the other books – actually, the one that I came out with this week um, – we had some music involved with it. I got the rights to play the songs and I I got to know that not only are people music fans, I mean, uh, football fans, but there's some very talented people uh, involved. And, and, and that's one of the things, but uh, football history, Arnie, um, a lot of the ones I've heard from the Baltimore faithful is that this team, the Colts were just basically taken out from underneath them. You know, I've watched the documentaries about them leaving with the Mayflower to go to Indianapolis, but I didn't realize how deep it was. And there have been several, uh, John Eisenberg being one of them, who told me, and uh, let's see, there was somebody else. My mind went blank on the, on the names, too. Did you have uh, Jim Johnson on, maybe? No, no. He wrote the book about uh, Don Shula and Johnny Unitas. Oh yeah, I'm I'm drawing a blank on him too, but I had him on my show a it long was, time. He was a fan. Jack Gildan. Yes, Jack Gildan. Uh, sorry, Jack, you, you're a great. It's it's been one of those weeks. Uh, 
they basically say that the, that the team was taken out from underneath them and no one had the chance to to fight back. And when Baltimore left, it's kind of like a part of that city left with them. And it, it's it's like you could talk about the history, you could talk about the, the players, you could talk about the coaches. Um, but the one thing that I really like and, and these guests, and I have several, several great guests that do this, it's you get to see the heart of it. It's not just numbers, it's not just dates, it's not just uh you know, it's not just stats. It's it's the heart. And and that's again, that's what that's what I want football's family to be about. Yeah, it reminds me of when I would and I probably should get this back on the show again. I I, I miss doing this. The like you you were like I said, you were the first one that was a non family member that sent in my football moment or my favorite football moment, I think yeah. is what I called it back then. And I would when I went to the Hall of Fame a couple of different years in a row and we would do uh, what we called on on scene or st- whatever on site locations where we would interview them and say, hey, what's your favorite football moment? I had multiple grown men crying like with tears and like had to quiver and couldn't stop because of their remembering their favorite football moments and reliving it. So there you go. Yep. Jack, Jack Guild, Jack Guild and Collision of Wills. That's what he's talking about, folks. Fantastic book. It's one of those books that I couldn't put down. Um, yeah, but, but when you actually talk to people and you say, well, it's just a sport. It's just a game. Yeah, it is. But you have a – it's like with, with Thanksgiving, it's just a day. Christmas is just a day. But it's the things that surround it that makes it special. Uh, I never had a college team that had tradition. When I moved down to Alabama – Two of my kids were born in Tuscaloosa. I got to experience tradition for the first time there with 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 Alabama, uh, with their with their habits and the things they're doing. And now the Titans, because they're getting national recognition, they've got tradition now. They've got heritage, and the thing that I'm, I'm enjoying about it is that they're drawing in Houston Oiler history, which is which is fascinating to me. Are they the Oilers now? No, but the Oilers still played a part in getting the Titans to where they are today. It's just, it's just neat to see. Yeah, there's, so you, you, you don't know, I guess, because I haven't released this episode, but the episode right before this one that's releasing, the ones that are listening now would already know. I interviewed Maya Washington, who's the daughter of Gene Washington, former uh MSU Spartan and my Minnesota Viking, uh, hall, uh, not Hall of Fame for the Vikings, but he was on the Super Bowl teams back in the the seventies and such. But the reason why we talked about there is it's it was a documentary movie book called Through the Banks of the Red Cedar, and it it covered the uh, essentially desegregation of college football and the MSU Spartans in the sixty five through sixty seven and beyond, where they really integrated and and they had a lot of black players from the South and it it kind of helped shed a light, you know, through sports, it, 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 it put a light on the nation for what importance it was to be able to, you know, everybody come together. And then also it was like, Hey, this is the team that could do this on the field. Why can't we do this in real life? And it we're still not there fully yet, but throughout time, I think that stuff like that sports really can teach you things, whether it's in life, whether it's in business, whether it's with your Absolutely. family and that kind of thing. So again, I go back to why I, I think that the premise of your show, Football is Family, at the surface, yes, it's about football, but really it's not. It's about everything else that is involved with it. And you know, with that being said, uh, again, let's go back to your, 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 your fandom for football. Your fandom is, uh, well, let's, call your, well, let's call it your Mount Rushmore, for instance. Mount Rushmore. And I'll I'll even let you include a non-Titans player if you want to. Uh, he might have the same name as a four-time Mr. Olympian. That's okay. You know, whatever you got to do. <laughs> He'll have an honorable mention. It's okay. A, it's a, I own two Jay Cutler jerseys. I own several autographs and several cards. I own two McFarlane figures. Uh, I don't own, if anybody has a Jay Cutler uh Miami Dolphins jersey. Let me know. I'm still looking for one. It's a yeah. That's a sickness too. Color for life. But anyway, no. If I had a 
uh, uh, Mount Rushmore, my uh, my guys, Elway would be right in the middle. Um, and you have to have his teeth big because he had a big smile. <laughs> but then if you were to put it on the sides, the, the people I remember watching growing up, it's not so much Titans now. If Derrick Henry played this year, he would be one of the greats of all time. I think he still has a, a great opportunity. But right now, he's not in the same league as Eddie George or anybody like that. Not yet. Not yet, but he will probably be better than Eddie George. But if I'm looking at it, and and I didn't respect this guy at the time, but Joe Montana, Joe Montana is is up there too. Uh, he's one of the guys that I didn't respect because he was beating my teams that I liked. He beat the Broncos. He beat the Bengals. He beat the Bengals. <laughs> you know he he uh, he was that good. He was that good, and I think uh, his play would actually transition to now. He was not the strongest arm, but he was the smartest quarterback on the field. So it, I, I say John Elway, Joe, Joe Montana. Um, I would put Eddie George up there because I just I just think he was great. I, I love Eddie George to death. He's fantastic, me personally, and and probably probably the fourth one. Uh, you know, that's a hard one to say because Jerry Rice keeps popping up in my head. I didn't respect his play until, you know, looking back and watching probably Jerry Rice. Yeah. I mean, that's, it's hard to really argue with a lot of those players, but it's a, it's near impossible task when you really break it down, whether you can say, okay, are they my favorite players or is it the top, these guys of this, this era, you know, all that kind of thing, which is a unique conversation to have i think has it been brought up too many times on your show about the goats and in, in comparing eras and things like that um jack gilden brought up johnny unitas and i was not i'm aware of johnny unitas i'm aware of him but when he was talking about how good he was i thought you know what i need to rethink how i view the goat uh because I had, you know, Tom Brady, Tom Brady, Tom Brady. No, Joe Montana. No, no. It probably could be Johnny Unitas. Uh, it could probably be Johnny Unitas. But if we're talking about my favorite of all time, it's it's Frank Wycheck, Steve McNair, Eddie George, and Javon Kurz. Hey, actually, that's what I was looking for initially, too. So that's perfect. Because, you know, the freak, Javon Kurz, I always oh, liked him going, you he know, was heavens. My, he was the first jersey I ever bought was Javon Kurz. It was a Puma. <laughs> yeah i mean i have uh you know I, of course being a lions fan i have a lot of lions fandom and such but the titans have been a team that i've always kind of half rooted for on the side because it's you know afc I've, I've grown fond of their their various teams that they've had throughout the years and of course now i'm just how can you not like the whole story of um i'm drawing a blank on tana hill's name there you go tana hill's story and the way that the titans have rose and stuff like that from really not i don't want to say from obscurity i don't know if that's the right word but they just seem like they team ball you know they, they play like team kind of thing maybe because of Rabel's influence i'm not sure what all it is there it's it's uh it's interesting to watch him because with and i was a marcus Mariota fan i was a jake locker fan i was a vince young fan Let's just go all the way back to 2006. I wanted them to draft color, but they didn't do it. All right, whatever. Um, Mariota had the opportunity, and I think that if he hadn't got hurt and down, he was probably still been the quarterback, uh, and he will start next year for somebody. He will. Um, but when Tannehill came in and put that team on his back and Derrick Henry started running like I knew he could, and, and A.J. Brown came in and lit the world on fire. And, and the defense this year stepped up. You, you see a team that just came together in the last three years to, to be one of the better ones in, in the uh, AFC. Only problem is we play in the same conference as Buffalo and Kansas City. Okay, so let's go with that. I mean, this is a history show, but because it's for football as family and you're a Titans fan – uh, what do you either a think they need to do to get over the hump to make that statement not true, or what would you like them to do to be able to get over the hump? Well, they need a they need a tight end, and I think that they're not going to draft one in the first round. They probably need to go offensive line first round. 
Um, they need to draft a quarterback in about the third or fourth round because of the cap room. Tannehill is taking up a lot of cap, which is fine. That's he's a starting quarterback. Uh, they need to have Derrick Henry, somebody to to uh, you know maybe two quarter uh, running backs to to rest him because he will break two thousand yards this year. Fingers crossed, um, <laughs> because he's just that good. But you can overwork a guy, and he can he 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 can just not be as good as he wants. Their defense, please sign Harold Landry. Please re-sign him. Uh, Jeffrey Simmons is a beast, and he will become – I don't know if he's going to be Aaron Donald, but he is almost to that level. That's how good he is. Uh, Caleb Farley uh, on corner is fantastic. Christian Fulton's fantastic. Uh, we need another cornerback and probably another uh, – probably free safety. Um, or a strong safety, just w- one kind of to get depth. And we probably need to look, like I said, at offensive line and another wide receiver. Julio is not what we thought he would be. Yeah, I mean, in his prime, no doubt, one of the greats, but oh, he's he just past it at this point. He would have been fantastic. He, I was watching a show yesterday that said the top 10 people who are no longer greats and I thought, oh, please don't have Julio. Please don't have yeah, Julio Jones was there. I was like, oh, God. <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, again, going back to in his prime, it was – he, like I was obviously a Megatron fan, but if someone wanted to make an argument for Julio being maybe 1A or 1B versus Megatron at the time, it would have been hard to argue against it kind of thing. But Julio, still, he's just Julio phenomenal. A freak of nature how good he is. How good he is. He is so – in his prime, he was smooth. It's kind of like when I was talking uh, to Ken Riley about his dad. Um, and that's one thing. I, I really, really love that personal uh, talking to Ken Riley uh, about his dad, who should be in the Hall of Fame. Put Ken Riley in the Hall of Fame. Um, <laughs> I told him, I said, your dad was not the fastest guy, but he was so smooth in running. It was effortless. It looks like he wasn't even running. All of a sudden, he, he got it. Julio wasn't the fastest guy, but he had such crazy speed, you know, quickness that he can hit a, a hit a route and his hands are just, are just perfect. Um, I just wish his hamstring held up this year. Well, that's been his, uh, I, I would like to say Achilles here, but that's been his hamstring issue for probably four or five years now. Yeah. I guess one of the reasons why the Falcons were willing to get rid of him, but, uh, Again, I'm I'm a, I'm a, I'm rooting for the Titans, and obviously the Lions are first, but they're one of my teams. I actually, my AFC team has always been uh, your riot, your <laughs> the guys you don't like, the Ravens. But that goes all the way back to when I was in uh, high school <laughs> as a Ray Lewis fan and everything, and organized defense or organized chaos. I should and say. On that defense. note, on that note, now right, that's one of the, again. It's it's all fun. It's it really is my. My wife was asking me a question. She said, uh, what would you have done if I told you I was a Ravens fan when we started dating? I said, well, it was nice knowing you. (laughs) (laughs) She said, you would have done that. I said, it was hard enough knowing that I'm marrying into a Steelers fan. Uh, My my father-in-law was from Pittsburgh. And and actually, I have the helmet over here. You see it over here in the corner. Uh, when he died, I got a lot of his Steelers stuff. But, uh, you know, he, he let me know when the Titans got beat by the Steelers. He let me know real fast. He would call me and say, hey, what was the score there? And, of course, you know, I had to respond to it. But I, I'll tell you this. One of the one of the highlights of my life, Arnie, uh, is the Steelers my, – my father-in-law and my mother-in-law moved up here to Tennessee with us about three or four years after we moved here. And the Steelers were coming to Nashville on a Sunday game. And you remember the game. It's the game that I think Linda White wiped his shoes with the terrible towel. And my wife said, I'm going to buy tickets to the game. I'm like, well, Katie, I can't go. I preached that day. She said, <laughs> I'm not taking you. What do you mean you're not taking me? It's the time. She said, I'm taking my dad to see the Steelers. I'm like, okay. So I get this picture of of them at the top part of Nissan Stadium, which I think it was LP Field at the time, and it's freezing. It's football weather. 
And he is cuddled up like this, and she's grinning big because she's got to be with her dad. And I thought, that's a that's a memory, because he died just a couple of years later. That's a memory that she will never lose and that she will have. And that's the football's family part. Yeah, I think you just summed it up very well as far as the premise and the the mission behind your podcast. Uh, again, part of the Sports History Network, I appreciate everything that you've come and done as far as once you jumped in, it was all hands on deck, help out everybody. And if anyone had a question within the group, it's something that I would, I'll give a little plug to the network at this point. You know, it's like a community. I really feel like all of you guys are, uh, you know, I could call up anytime if I wanted to and, hey, I need some help with this. And boom, there you go. Let's go <laughs> after it. Let's let's work together. See, Ar- Arnie calls me and I'm sitting in the car and my youngest daughter said, who's Arnie? I said, well, he he, he runs the, the, the sports history network. She, so she said, I want to talk to him. I want to talk to him. I said, <laughs> Armini, just 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 let Daddy talk a little bit. I think she did talk to you a little bit. Yeah, I got a chance to talk a little bit to her as well. Yeah, she is. Uh, that's my little uh, my little chatterbox. It took us a long time to get her talking, but when uh, we got her talking, she she hasn't stopped since. It's kind of like one of those things when you wind it up and it's not quite working, but you know, once it starts, it's like it just never stops. Oh, so never that's, stops. that's perfect. See, <laughs> and and uh, I, I'll tell you this: she is a. Uh, She'll sit there and watch. When we adopted her, she was not into touch. She didn't want to be touched. She didn't want to be held. She didn't want to be anything because of the situation she came from. But now I sit down to watch a football game, and guess who's sitting in my lap? That's awesome. Yeah, absolutely <laughs> it is. So with that being said, too, I'm going back to the uh, football is family mantra. Um, we, I guess now is probably a good time. We should make sure we let the listener of the show, uh, again, remind them what the name of the podcast is and where the listener of the show can find you. Oh yeah. Yeah. Football's family is the name of the podcast. You can find us on a lot of places, I believe. Um, you can find me on Twitter at J E R E M Y underscore M C F A R L I N. And while I'm not very good at this yet, uh, we do have a football's family Facebook page every now and then I'll put some stuff up there, but I'm basically on Twitter you can message me. I typically get back to you pretty quickly because I have no life. Uh, no, I, I, I get back because I like to talk. Uh, if you want to be on this, you don't have to write a book. You don't have to be a historian. If you just like football, even if it's high school football, college football, USFL, I've had USFL people on, uh, Arena League, you'll have to educate me on Arena League. but. I, I want to talk. This is this is not my show. This is your show. I'm just here. You're just here living in the world and just helping guide someone along. So with that being said, how about the last words of wisdom from a gridiron knowledge footballist family perspective for the listener of the show? Don't apologize for liking your team. You can you can be ashamed of how they're playing or whatever. Don't apologize for it. Because there's a reason why you like that team. If somebody's giving you a hard time, just kind of grin and say, it's fine. Uh, But I was sitting – my granddad died when my son was a year old. He wore – before he died, he wore this ugly-looking Tennessee Titans hat. I have it now. It's not ugly. It's a part of him. So if you've got a fandom, even if it's because you like the team that's in the Super Bowl, don't apologize for it. Just just embrace it. Find the history of it. Find find the reason why you like it and wear it proudly. You know, wear it proudly. Uh, I have on my head right now my Titans uh, uh, salute to service. We had uh, – they, they, they'll have – you know, military coming there. We give them a standing ovation when they come to Nissan Stadium. It's like you do in other places too. Just be proud of who you are. Be proud. Never apologize. And always, always tighten up. There you go. Tighten up. Jeremy, if you want to use that clip, I give you full rights and do so and everything which way you please, as long as it's not besmirching the name of Detroit Lions. But how about that other message? Never apologize for your fandom doesn't matter what your team is. I mean, if you've ever listened to this show, you probably know I'm an unapologetic Detroit Lions fan. And I always will be, 
I'll never be unapologetic, and I'll continue to love them till the day I die. And that's one reason I love the concept of Jeremy's show, because I can fully relate to the concept of football as family. If you ever listen to any of these episodes, you know what I'm talking about. And I want to say again, a huge thank you to Jeremy McFarlane, the football is family. <laughs> we'll call him the football is family dude. This guy is a major reason why the football history dude, the podcast that is, and the website, and just me in general, is still around. Almost four years later, as I'm recording this, and it's going to be released, I think it's going to be, ah, uh, geez, only like a month. A little bit over a month, and then it'll be four whole years since this thing has been going strong. So I also thank you, the listener, for sticking around on this ride, being shotgun, maybe knocking me out, taking the keys of my DeLorean. Let's go anywhere you want. Let's go back in time. Again, if you want to go back in time yourself with uh, starting your own podcast about sports history, well, you know where to go. That's sportshistorynetwork.com. Another thing that would not be around if Jeremy wasn't there, because he helped me through getting the Football History Podcast going. And then it led to ultimately Sports History Network. So again, Jeremy, thank you, thank you, thank you. But as you said, and I don't remember if this was in the recording or not, or if this was just some other time, here's a special thank you for you. A special closing, if you will. I'm going to go ahead and say, Jeremy, I'm through if you're through. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Football History Dude. To make sure you're the first to get the next episode, Please subscribe on your podcast player of choice and head on over to the footballhistorydude.com for the show notes and more information on the history of the NFL. And remember, dudes, where we're going, we don't need roads. Okay, so now you've listened to the post credits, whatever you want, the post song, the hey, go to footballhistory.com and all that stuff. So this is behind the curtain moment. This is some stuff that Jeremy and I talked about after the podcast. A lot of times I have this after the podcast, after the interview, that is the recording session. A lot of times I have these moments where I have uh, what I'm calling, I'm using air quotes, your off the record conversations where I forget to press the record button or I press the stop record button and then I get into these varying conversations about all sorts of stuff, life and sports and whatever. And Jeremy and I had one of these that we thought would be good to share with anybody that was listening. So we decided let's add it to the post credits here. It's not football related, even though there's some football talk in here, but it's it's life related. So I understand if you need to skip through this to the end because you can't, you're dying to get to the more sports history network content. And who can blame you because the sports history network is awesome, and all of our po- all of our podcast hosts are awesome as well. But again, I, I think this is very, uh, I think this is very good for anybody to listen to because you never know who you're going to help, or maybe maybe you're you you want this message for yourself, whatever it is. And you don't know how you're going to do it. So kick back. Here's a few minutes. Peeking into Jeremy and me just having a conversation, albeit a second time almost having the conversation. But here's the topic that we talked about. Maybe tell you, tell your story a little bit if you want. I just press the recording button however you want to do it and I'll find a way. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, when I was growing up in the 80s and 90s, um, I was experiencing things that I didn't know how to explain. When I was hit, I might've been 34 or 35. I, I hit a bottom, my bottomed out and I got diagnosed with, uh, depression and anxiety issues. And in fact, and and without getting into too much, uh, personal things, because, you know, it can be embarrassing for some to say these things, but I'm not embarrassed. I just want people to know these things. Um, When I was 
I had to go to counseling and, and I'm still dealing with that now at, at 42. Uh, I started thinking, how could I use my position as a preacher, my position as now a podcaster to help me, to help other people? So I got up in the pulpit and I told people I have this. This is what's going on. And it's kind of it's almost a release to say. Uh, but at the same time, you know, you're thinking, well, what are people going to say that their preacher has depression? I had so many people come up to me and hug me. And I had people come up to me later on and said, because of what you said, I'm getting help now. Well, with this podcasting ability, I, I can choose guests or I can just get on my own. So a few weeks ago, A.J. Brown, who is who's quickly becoming one of my favorite players of all time. He's just a great guy, great player. He came up and said that he contemplated suicide. And you think, well, how could a young man who is good looking, who's going to make a lot of money, who's great at what he does, how could he contemplate suicide? The very fact that a man like A.J. Brown could get up and say what he did. That's a man right there who is willing to let his faults or what you would consider faults or his weaknesses strengthen other people. So I wanted to mention that. So I mentioned it and I had, uh, I think it was, it was episode, I can't remember what it was, episode 58. And it wasn't a long episode. Well, about three weeks later, I, I talked to a guy who, before I started recording, said, I heard that episode. Thank you for doing that. You never know what good you can do. You live that life even with your faults, even with your dings, even with your dents. You never know what good you can do, and you never know who's listening. You never know who's watching. There you go. I mean, I could keep going on and on about that, but again, I I appreciate someone like you who's willing to, to, to step out on the limb and be willing to open up the vest, whatever you want to say, you know, like say, hey, this is what's going on. Because the thing is, everybody has something in their life that they're struggling through dealing with, has I don't know what the words to say it right now, but they, they, they're they almost like, I don't know what to do. And I even got to that point one time and I don't know what you can throw any kind of label you want on it. But for lack of better terms, I got um, anxiety, I'll call it, you know, when I was dealing with uh, So I went and I opened up a plant down in Texas and for, for the same company I still work for, which I worked for back then. I wasn't ready for it from a management perspective or anything like that. It was so much going on in my, in my life that it, it really got me like I said, like I never had dealt with that before, not being able to sleep, not being able to like, you know, the heart racing type of thing. And it, I didn't, I took it up of the path of at first, Oh, there must be something physically wrong with me. Right. Just like most right. people do there's oh, there, it's just, you know, I'll fight through it. I'll, I'll put some dirt on it. I'll rub through it. You know, cause that's always a phrase you had used in football, for instance, you know, it's, Oh, you got hurt. Let's put some dirt on it. It's just a flesh wound type of deal. But then it's when you're able to, like you said, really, open up and think about it and be willing to get to the point where you can accept that, you know what, it doesn't mean that this is a weakness of mine or it's a, a flaw or whatever you want to call it. It's something that I just, I, I aware, I'm aware that's there and I'm going to be able to just strengthen the muscle to be able to work on, you know, being able to work with people and with others to be able to get past this and through it and then help everybody come along with it. So I, I think that's, that's why I like that. I did listen to that episode. You know, that, that one as well. I told you I haven't been able to listen to everything on the network, but I appreciated that type of that, episode and being able to share that as well. You never realize how strong you are until you take about two steps back and look at where you came from. The very fact, Arnie, that I can stand up here and first off, um, and I, again, I'm not going to go into specifics, but uh, I shouldn't be here right now. I shouldn't be here right now. It's because I have... At the time, I had two loving kids. I had a loving wife. She's still she's still there with me, despite all that I have been through. And I had loving parents, and I had a church family that that surrounded me and 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 helped me. My grandmother, my granny, uh, when I told them all that I was going through, they were able they they were willing to to pull me up. and And they said, "You're not alone." And that's one thing I always felt like there was something wrong with me. 
I was alone. No one would understand. And when I get up and say, this is what I'm going through, there are people out there that says, you know what? I got you. I understand that. Well, technically, they don't understand what I'm going through. They're going through something on their own, but they're in the same ballpark as you. And, and I've said this on a couple of my episodes. You're not alone in 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 this. Uh, last year in August, and it's we're 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 still having some issues here in Waverly, Tennessee. There was a flash flood that ended up killing 21 people. Seven. Uh, two uh, uh, seven-month-old twins got swept away from their dad. Her dad was holding on to them. They got swept away. And I talked to the dad, and I was just blown away. I didn't know that was him. This, When this is filmed, it's on the 19th, or recorded on the 19th. On the 17th of February, our school school system was let out because of bad weather. And I thought, ah, that's not going to have any bearing on anybody. Just go to school. But one of the parents said, well, Jeremy, there's still a lot of kids here who are scared to death of storms because of the flood. It didn't dawn on me. Of course, you're like, oh, Jeremy should know these things. But it didn't dawn on me that the physical can get cleared up pretty quick. The mental part, if it's not addressed, will never get cleaned up. And in fact, I had a I had a guy who who recommended a book to me and I, I still haven't been able to find it. It said feelings buried alive are never dead. If you're dealing with things right now and you try to bury them and push them aside, they're never gone. That's why you, you never realize how strong you are until you go and face these things. So I encourage people who are experiencing, you know, anxiety. I, I remember I, I, married my cousin and her husband. I, I did their, their wedding on Thanksgiving at my aunt and uncle's house. I was wearing a pair of blue jeans and a, and a, and a button up shirt, very informal. I grabbed my wife and said, Katie, I'm having a heart attack. It was a panic attack. Didn't know what it was. Why in the world at that moment was that? When you start digging in, you start to see there's things out there that you cannot you have to face head on or it's, or it's going to kill you. It's literally going to eat you alive. Yeah. I fully understand that from that right there. My, I didn't experience that as much, but yeah, trying to get in, you know, through meditations or other type of avenues that I've gone through to try to figure out how do you, um, for lack of better terms, um, I don't know, muddy, go through, uh, bog through the muddy waters. If I'm even saying that right. But yeah, it's easy for people to say, you know, put, you know, put your tough hat on, just get through it. But that's, that doesn't really do anything. So again, I, I'm, I'm with you I'm here for anybody that, you know, wants to even chat about something, if nothing less. Yeah. Uh, message, message me. I, you don't even have to give me your name. I don't have to know your name. I'm here to listen. I do this for a living, but also uh, it doesn't matter who you are. Uh, I want to hear, I want to listen. And, and I know that there are people out there that want to listen. So don't feel like you're alone. You're not alone. You're not by yourself. You have avenues to help. And and I want to point out this here, Arnie, and, and this would probably be a good way to, to close with this. Um, when somebody says that they are thinking of suicide, take it serious. Take it serious. Maybe they're trying to get attention, but you... If you don't act upon it, it will be on your conscience for the rest of your life. You might be the reason somebody stays alive right now. You never know that. So I, I can tell you in my profession, um, I had I had a young, young uh, I was a youth minister in Georgia. And a few years later, you know, I went to preach where I am now. And I got a message from that person saying, thank you for what you did back then. I didn't even remember doing anything, but she did. You never know what good you can do. So always be ready. Always be ready. You can do something good tonight. Again, thank you for listening through to this. I hope that it gave you anything that you might need from it. And if you 
can think about ways to help anybody out. Like we said, we're always there ourselves. Doesn't matter who you are, what you are, where you're at. Just reach out. But I suppose I got to give this one last special closing again to Jeremy. Dude, I'm through if you're through. We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football. Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s. Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports. Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories. And Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today! Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io.